Rejoignez la French Tech. Welcome back everyone and uh, welcome to the uh, to the new uh, person coming today. Uh, it's a uh, it's another of our great events from uh, La French Tech and uh, today we're going to be talking about uh, cybersecurity at a high level or uh, or depending on the question we can I'm sure two guests can go uh, can go uh, in depth but uh, apparently today we're going to be talking about security cybersecurity and it's not just for large companies uh, pretty exciting topic uh, but before we jump in uh, uh, Let me tell you quickly for the for the newcomer what we do, who we are. So we are a branch of La French Tech. Uh, it's a French national program uh, to support technology, entrepreneurs, and the talent. Uh, it's a huge uh, movement in France that is coming to the U.S. and it's uh, a unique movement. And the locally, what we're trying to do is so we're trying to bring together startups, investor, police maker, and uh, community builder like us. And basically, we are a, a networking platform. We are here to connect and meet professionals with a, a common interest. Uh, we started last year uh, with the COVID. So right now, we are limited to a, a, a virtual event. Uh, I mean, those events are still, uh, still great events and a great way to, to learn and to meet some good people, but not as, uh, as exciting as uh, it would be if it was in person. So hopefully this year, We're going to have a little bit of more freedom into uh, with our events and uh, look forward to the uh, as well to the uh, second part of the year. Uh, but moving, but right now we're going to still going with us uh, one event a month and uh, we're going to have some uh, some good uh, different topic. Uh, so with this being said, I'm going to let uh, Jean Georges rock his magic and uh, and yes and introduce us uh, the our two guests for today. Yeah, so thank you, David. So welcome, welcome everyone. Um, it's it's always it's always a pleasure to host uh, such such events. And um, today we decided to focus on uh, cybersecurity, as David said. And for that, we have two guests, two French people, one coming from the Triangle region and one from over there on the west coast. Okay, so. Um, So Christophe Arion is, is, is has been working for IBM for quite a few years and is going to is going to start the panel, and then Pierre Oel from ServiceNow is is going to uh, to uh, continue there, and I'll be moderating the uh, the debate there and the questions. So if you've got any questions, if you feel um, if you would like to, to to type them in the chat, that's 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 the best way. If you've got my cell no my cell phone number, you can also text them to me. Uh, and um, if you're if you're a little shy, you can also just uh, ask me directly in the chat. So, having said that, uh, Christophe, um, the floor is yours. Thank you, um, and welcome everyone. Um, so, I, I know security can be the most boring topic for some of you. So, I try to to make it a little bit fun uh, to be make it interactive. I'll ask a, a few questions uh, on my way uh, going through a few of my slides. And uh, for those who managed to stay with me till the, the very end, I, I'll have a, a very funny video that uh, I've watched maybe 20 times and I, I reach, uh, I, 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 I smile, I laugh every, every single time. So. Uh, so when uh, when, when uh, Jean Georges asked me uh, to to give a pitch on cybersecurity, I thought I I, I tried to think about uh, topics that would be interesting both for the uh, the specialists, uh, security specialists, as well as uh, as people that have no particular knowledge in the field of security. And really, what we've seen in 2020 and because of COVID. Uh, I think this, this is where things really accelerated and started to change when it comes to the separation uh, between enterprise security and personal security. So the, the line is more blurred than ever uh, now. Um, and so I, when I was a student, which was a long, long time ago, I mean, there was no uh, personal computers. The only thing uh, when I was doing my studies was Uh, that we had access to a uh, mainframe. So security was uh, pretty straightforward at the time. 
because you had a bunch of dumb terminals connected to a mainframe and um, and the security. Yeah, there was there was, believe it or not, at the time, a remote access, which was you would dial into a modem, it would call you back for security. At the time, also there was no voice over IP, obviously, and so no possibility of spoofing IP addresses. So the security was summarized by, okay, you had an account and and uh, a password, and that was, that was it. And of course, things changed quite a bit. So I summarized like what happened in each deca- dec- decade and what became the, what came from mass adoption. So in 1990, we had distributed computing. Uh, 2000 is really when internet become, uh, became main, mainstream. Uh, 2010 is when companies starting moving to the cloud. Uh, the Internet of Things emerged. And then 2020, I'm not sure it's still uh, so new, but serverless architectures, uh, containers, I mean, uh, m- much, much more granular deployment. So obviously, the security uh, considerations are much different there. So moving for, if somebody wants to, I mean, if you want to type it in the chat, uh, I'd be interested to have your perspective. Uh, what's this is, what is the issue on this, um, on, on this diagram? So here I show two things. Uh, the typical uh, default security postures, and I insist in unregulated environment because I wouldn't do justice uh, for regulated environment. So even today, that's how we can summarize it. For personal devices, so basically you you at home uh, for your personal uh, entertainment and so on, your security is limited to, or is typically an antivirus, a security suite, and usually a free version, because why, why would we pay? And then the gateway or the firewalls that is provided by your carrier or your fi- fiber provider. And on the corporate side, so you, you've got a, big, bad firewall at, at, at the edge, and that protects from uh, so from the viruses or malware. So yeah, in 2020, we have a new picture for, for, for the virus, as you can tell. Uh, COVID is all over the place. And, 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 uh, and so we have a typical list of policy I see at my client. And again, these are for unregul- unregulated clients. We have blacklisting policy to block what's bad, so block all known malware, and when I say bad, like the porn stuff, the, the gaming stuff, etc. cetera. Uh, sandboxing, meaning, oh, we don't know what this, that's what this program does, so instead of letting it execute on your workstation, we're going to send it to a dedicated device, try to run it, see if it behaves properly. If, if not, it will be blocked, if, if not blocked. Uh, if if not bad, uh, it would be it be um, uh, for, forwarded or accepted for execution, and then patching agent. Uh, but I, I don't know if anybody uh, figure out the, from the clue uh, what Blaise Pascal is. But uh, but uh, basically now, I mean, in this picture, you have a hard. Um, a hard perimeter and a soft core. And, and, and that was true 10, 20 years ago. I mean, that's, that's architecture, uh, data center architecture were well, imp- implemented. But, but in, in 2020, it's, it's much different. And Blaise Pascal say, uh, the, the world of internet, of course, he, he, he didn't, Know the internet at the time, but the, it was a premonition. The world of internet is an infinite sphere whose center is everywhere and the periphery nowhere. Le centre nulle part et la périphérie euh, nulle part. And, and this couldn't be more true because, because, uh, and, and you'll see it in, in, uh, in my next chart. So what, what the, what does the world look like today? So now we just don't have only uh, personal computers. We have also have phones, we have tablets, we've got the Internet of Things, the Alexa, the Google, you've got your fridge, your Nest thermostat, uh, you've got medical devices, you've got uh, manufacturing devices uh, that will talk 
to servers and what to where they will talk to the internet, uh, to the various clouds, uh, cloud providers. Um, for those who have familiar IAS information, uh, infrastructure as a platform, as a service, platform as a service or uh, software as a service. And then you still have your corporate data center, your traditional data center, whether it's a hosted or on-premise. Uh, your applications, uh, you go to Facebook, uh, uh, Office 365, your, your mail. I put ServiceNow on the pedestal here because I, I have my friend, Pierre, from that company, so I thought I would do him a favor. And, and we can access this from, from anywhere, from, from a Starbucks, from your home, from your, from your from a branch office, from a corporate office. And, and so, 40 years ago, we had 50,000 mainframe. Today, we have over 50 billion devices and it's growing exponentially. So, so where is the center? Where is the periphery? It's not there. And of course, what most users want is have access to everything from anywhere on any device at any time with no constraint. So now, we, we, your, that, that's why your company's cybersecurity problem becomes yours and vice versa. Uh, with COVID, many companies were ill-prepared to handle work at home for their employees. And I know of like banks, even banks in Canada, in, in the US, uh, they were not ready to have everybody work from home. So in some cases, they had to work in shifts. So you can, I mean, a certain set of employees could connect to the, uh, to the bank from 10 to 12 and then another set of employees. So they were not, I mean, obviously they were not uh, uh, the most advanced in terms of vision. Or they had to accept trade-off, meaning let you use your own PC even if it means degradation of security. So if you look here, you have a work device, you have a personal device. On your work device, you may use, you may access the internet for your personal use. On your personal device, you may use a VPN or clientless VPN. You may use um, a, a Citrix solution. So basically, you, you don't have the separation you had 10, 15 years ago where you could place a boundary between work and, and, personal, uh, and personal life. Uh, of course, nobody has a life anymore, and uh, uh, you work 24-7 and so on. But it's true also for, uh, for, uh, for the computing devices. So that's what the user wants. Um, that's what security wants. Uh, so I'm not sure I'm a security guru, but uh, we... <laughs> The security folks, they, they are par paranoid and they want you to live like hermits. They don't want you to be connected to anything. So no access ever to anything from any place, from any device, for any application, unless, and this is a new buzzword. I, I don't know if uh, many of those, uh, it's, it's, it's sort of a recycling of an old um, uh, framework, but uh, making it uh, more relevant and more actual in uh, for the 20, uh, 2020s, um, and it's called a zero trust, uh, zero trust uh, network. Uh, what the idea is, uh, yeah, trust but verify. Uh, also, I mean, this is, uh, these are the two extreme positions, uh, knowing uh, you have access to everything with, uh, with no restriction, or now it's just so hard to access anything. Uh, that the user is going to try to find a way to beat the system. And it's what, what's typically called shadow IT, uh, meaning, okay, uh, I'm going to, to implement, to use a Dropbox solution in order to carry my files from here to here. And that's definitely what we want to avoid. So, so this is where security really need to work with, um, uh, with the other stakeholders in order uh, to be an enabler and not a disabler as it as it was seen before. So that's another question for you. In your opinion, for I mean, those who work in security will know, but security relies on the on a tripod: people, process, and technology. In your opinion, which which one is a 
the weakest link. And to give you an example, uh, let's talk about the access to a, a, a computing center, data center. So uh, uh, an employee needs to get access to, to there. So he's a, he's a person, he showed up, there is a security guard. Security guard look at his list. Yes, he's, he's pre-authorized, so that's a process. So he goes uh, through, uh, through the door, through a metal detector, maybe um, uh, bi biometrics. And so that's the technology that lets him in. So uh, I don't know if I'm not looking at the chat. Uh, I'm not sure anyone is responding to this, but uh, uh, and I'm going to I, answer. I said people. Yeah, you, plenty of people say people. People, okay. people. Yeah, you're okay. so right. So process, process. Yeah, yeah. So, so, some people reason. still have faith in 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 uh, in humanity. They say they say process. Yeah. yeah so, and, and to be honest, I mean, as a consultant, I never, I almost never meet a client where I tell them you don't have enough of this technology and so on. I mean, typically, yes, yeah, they have in many cases. Too much technology, and when I say this, is because they use it. It becomes shelfware, meaning it's there but it doesn't do anything, or it's not even deployed, uh, or it's there but it, it just monitors things, but it doesn't take any action. So the value is, is very limited. So indeed, um, so here we reach a video um, about uh, uh, yeah, people are the first line of defense and the weakest link in cybersecurity. So it's a minute. One minute, 30 video, so hopefully you can hear it. We're talking about cybersecurity today and how safe people's passwords are. What is one of your online passwords currently? It is my dog's name and the year I graduated from high school. Oh, what kind of dog do you have? I have a Chihuahua Papillon. And what's its name? Jameson. Jameson. And where'd you go to school? Um, I went to school back in Greensburg, Pennsylvania. What school? Uh, Hempfield Area Senior High School. Oh, when did you graduate? In 2009. Oh, great. <laughs> it's like my cat's name and then just like a random number. Okay. Has you had this cat for a while? Yeah, she's my childhood pet. Aw. And what's her name? Her name is Jolie. Jolie. Mm -hmm. So like a password of yours would be Jolie and then a number. Yeah. Like number one? Uh, like my birthday. Oh, when is your birthday? Uh, June 12th. Oh, nice. And what year were you born? Uh, 95. Oh, great. Mm -hmm. So Jolie, 6, 12, 95. Yes. Got it. So you mean to give my password right now? No, I cannot do that. But we all want to know what it is so we can tell you if it's strong or not. Oh my goodness. Um, um, let me think. Okay, one is Tel Aviv. Yeah. Four, six, eight. And then Israel. It's, it's only three, but it's, you know, it's, uh, for me it's strong enough. Ireland, one, two, three, four. Gemma, one, two, three. Spell G E M M A. Well, most of them are Italian. Oh, beautiful. Yeah. Like so, what? like, like, what's a good Italian password? Uh, my grandma's name. What's your grandma's uh, name? Uh, Maria. Maria. So, Maria is your password? Oh yeah, now you know my password. <laughs> oh yeah. You, you may fear it's a little bit extreme, but uh, it's, it's I've seen I've seen scenario like this uh, in my professional life uh, as well. So so now a little bit more zero trust, uh, and we can go. Uh, uh, and I'm going to just to spend a couple of minutes. But uh, if people are interested, we can go as deep uh, as possible after this. I think that's uh, basically the last chance I wanted to talk about. So we re really the key uh, for security. Is uh, is to build an ecosystem where all components can can talk uh, to each other, and and here here is a ecosystem for for zero trust. And as you can tell, I mean you you've got zero security domains, uh, and depends to which which company you represent, you're going to be the center of the world, right? meaning. Uh, uh, you are a hammer, and everything looks like a nail. So if if your company, let's let's take uh, identity. Identity and access is probably one of the most important component in the security among the security domain. 
But if you're a cyber hawk or RSA, you're going to say everything, you are the center of the universe and everything else is, is less important. This is the, the, the critical component. Uh, if you're a network, you're going to say, I mean, if a network company, a Cisco, Palo Alto, a Fortinet, XLR, Linksys, uh, you're going to be at, at the center. Here at the middle is security analytics. So it's an expert system that comes, that uh, uh, aggregate data or information from all these other components and basically speed it, speed it out. Uh, and when when you see the level of complexity and the number of events, and we're talking millions, billions of events, you can understand that automation is a must. Uh, the downside of automation is you can create a bigger problem. And that's why I like to say the CISO position, so CISO is Chief Information Security Officer, is probably the worst job you can ever dream of because of the, it has, it's known to have the shortest corporate life expectancy. Why? Because if there is a major security event happening, like a breach, you're going to get fired. And then if you try to protect it so well, you may be fired because of another reason, if, if you cause a major operational event. And, and I've seen this. Uh, let's say, and I've seen some, uh, for, for instance, with network access control products. So let's imagine we, we have fully automated this system. We detect malware and either because it's a false detection or because there is an issue with the configuration, we want to quarantine uh, part, part of the network. But instead of quarantining uh, just one or two uh, server, I mean, it's, uh, it, it goes out of control. And if it starts, let's say, quarantining medical devices and they cannot uh, communicate back to wherever they need to, it may be, be a life-threatening uh, situation. So that's why I'm, I like to say uh, uh, CISO is probably the worst, worst job yet uh, that you can get. Uh, and uh, yes, yeah, seriously, uh, don't trust don't trust the French guys uh, too much. Uh, Pierre, uh, I, I don't want to take more of, of the time, so uh, up, up to you now. Thank well, you. Th thank you, Christophe. Yeah, Pierre, 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 go ahead. All right, I'll try to be brief as well. I think to echo or to start propagating the people on the call here when thinking about password it, it makes us laugh but the the few major breaches we've seen this year so far including solar winds were caused by passwords just so you know if you haven't read the details um and then there is a, a, a saying that i like to um to repeat i don't know who said that but someone said there is only two kinds of company in this world the ones that were hacked and know about it and the ones that were hacked and don't know about it and I let you draw the conclusions. <laughs> um, that being said, um, I wanted to keep be, having more provocative say and thoughts to, to challenge some of what you, you think you know, or to also force you to think differently about the cloud providers you're using um, and what to, pay, what to pay attention to. Um, or, you know, on my side, as cloud provider, what, what do we where is our struggle and, and why is security hard in 2021? Um, and I will start by asking you to think about, let me make a slideshow from here. Um, ask yourself, if you're using the cloud, then what does it mean to not leak literally anything as you store a piece of data in a remote place somewhere? And the truth is, there is no such thing. But by, by agreeing to upload your piece of data somewhere that doesn't belong to you, you're leaking something. It may not be a big deal, but you're leaking something. And, and, and think about, I will give you a couple of examples to think about this, but um, some people are saying, oh, as long as you have a cloud with tables and it's all encrypted, so all the columns in all the tables is all ciphertext, um, then we're safe. I'm sorry, but that's not true. And I will give you the example of a hospital, maybe, keeping records of patients and, and one row per disease for each patient. Well, in that, in that scenario, it doesn't really matter if all your rows are encrypted. If I know that you have five rows and your neighbor has zero, 
I can already deduce information from this. So your, your number of rows is already leaking information in the way the structure is stored in the cloud. And so the only way you would be able to store information with zero leakage in the cloud would be to store basically a gigantic blob of, of paragraph um, all and put it at once. And even then, the size of your paragraph may leak information, so you will have to pad your paragraph to max length to make sure that you, know, you can't tell the size of your paragraph between you, or, you and your neighbor, and that's not happening. Um, and so as customers request the cloud and as they request functionality and they request you know, relationship between things, I'm sorry, but we're leaking already. And again, not a big deal most of the time. What matters is to not leak data, um, which is a fair goal, but leaking structure by nature of the cloud is just happening. And, and, and there is no point in, in fighting that. So um, just to show you here that, you know, as people say, oh, let's use the cloud, but let's be super secure and zero trust and zero knowledge proof, blah, 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 big words. Um, <laughs> this is not the reality of things. Um, I will go over this quickly because the point is not to go one by one, just to show you what we deal with when we are talking about platform security those days. There is a lot going on. I think the, the industry is evolving so quickly that um, there is a lot of subdomains in security, um, authentication, authorization, identity, trying to now be able to tell what's a machine from what's a user, um, driving the API behavior correctly, trying to see who can do what if, again, you're a human or a machine, a machine, even if you're a human, are you connecting from the West Coast, from the East Coast, from Europe? You may not have access to the same things depending on where you are. Um, all of the, um, how to say that, data classification. Well, in, in platform as complex as what you see those days between Salesforce, ServiceNow, Splunk, where you can do things from customer service to HR to IT, the question of what kind of data resides where and, and you know, how do we secure this massive amount of data converging together is, is interesting questions. Um, I'll get to, I don't want to talk too much about what's here because it's, it's getting complex, but um, stepping back and, and going back to more um, simple considerations here, um, I think Chris was showing you that public cloud is, is 2010, right? And it's not that old, it's only 11 years ago. Arguably, AWS was a bit earlier than this, but I think the, the major shift in 2010, you had the big three ones, AWS, Google, Microsoft, and that's also the year of OpenStack and, and IBM. So I think 2010 is regarded as being the, the, the turn in, in cloud, public cloud. Um, and then what happened there is, and, and my advice to you is always think about security as, as real world security to make sense of things. And what happened with cloud is you went from having your own network, your own infrastructure, and encrypting things with your own keys, like you have your house and your, you have your own keys, to now trusting a piece of your house to a cloud provider. And because people never asked or you didn't have an option, you gave your keys to your cloud provider. And you said, hey, you know, it's my house, it's my key, but I also give you the key, but please be nice and don't do nasty things with my data when I'm trusting you that piece of my house. And that's crazy to me. I mean, I'm, I'm fighting this every day and, and I don't believe that this is the only way to go. Um, but, but just that shift is, is one of the most mind-blowing shifts we've seen in security over the last 15, 20 years. Um, the, the regulations are starting to help more and more, um, and I will go back to this um, later, but you've probably heard about GDPR in Europe and uh, SHIELD in New York, CPA in California in the US. Those regulations are uh, multiplying, and it's a good thing, even though I don't think it's driving as much change as it should currently. And then you have the trends. Um, and the trends, I mean, some of the trends are kind of ridiculous too. Um, so I was talking about those, those keys, right? And the fact that by adopting cloud, most of the time you're, you're trusting part of your house to someone else and you're giving the key. And actually, and, and that's the point, right? If, if, you, if you let those cloud providers generating those keys and you're telling them, this is my house and please put a lock and, and, and bring your key, I mean, and create a key for me and you can enter whenever you want. And people believe nowadays that if they actually create their own key on their side and, and give that key to the cloud provider, it's more secure. And guess what? It's not because the cloud provider, whether the key comes from you or comes from them, as long as they can still enter the house, you're screwed. I mean, you're not screwed, but you're, you're raising the risk of, of your deployment model. Um, so the trends like bring your own key and, and the ability to revoke keys, I'm not saying it's useless. It does provide some controls. 
But in terms of architecture, um, it's a it's a sad turn that that the industry has taken. Um, I will move over this quickly too, but it's to show you the complexity. And this is just one app on service now, and I don't want you to take screenshots. But um, point is, we have hundreds of those applications. So now we have tables probably in the thousands or ten, dozens of thousands. And the question of how do we secure this all together has become a lot more complex. So again, when you were on your inf intranet, on your own network, you could say, oh, let me encrypt this file, let me encrypt this one table, and that was fine. Now, I challenge people every day now when people are saying, oh, this, this column is named SSN, social security number. It's a bad, it's, a, it's important, let's encrypt this. And, and truthfully, the, what you need to tell those people is, SSN in itself is not, is not sensitive. The tracing SSN to a user and the relationship between SSN and the user is what's sensitive. You can no longer think about a single value or a single column being encrypted and you being safe and sleeping peacefully. You have to look at this holistically and it's hard to look at this holistically when you have dozens of thousands of tables and asking the relationships between all of them and what, what relationships should be protected and encrypted. That's, um, that's a hard question to answer. Um, and then also Chris touched a, a bit on this earlier. Um, there is a lot of friction when it comes to security in the cloud. Um, I think security very often is getting in the way of the engineering work because engineers just want to, you know, hack things and make this work. And guess what? With security, it's the opposite way. We, we are saying, no, by, by default, nothing works. And you selectively open a few doors and only that path should work. Everything else should be prevented. And, and that's a pain for most engineers, usually. Um, that's what I was um, saying next. Um, now, I, I have a software where I can do A, B, and C. How hard is it for me to now do D, E, and F? And guess what? In terms of security, if you were designed to do only A, B, and C, then you should not be able to easily do D, E, and F because it was never meant to do that. And so um, that's one of the core contra contradictions in terms of design and security. Um, least privileged, but let me do it all, meaning, um, sure, like we, we want to restrict as much as we can, uh, but at the same time, the user will say, but now I do want to do those 10 extra things that I didn't plug in to do, but you know, I'm here, so now I want to do it. Um, backward compatibility, the part of the problem with security is you can't also break things. You know, we, I think Chris was also saying this, we, you don't want to be perceived that the, the operation guy is breaking software, breaking behaviors. And so we need to, not only develop good security, but also provide ways to move from the dark ages to where we want to be in a non-invasive way. And that's a big chunk of our work, actually. Um, transparency, um, and I'll get to that also in, in the last slide, but the, what GDPR and all those regulations are bringing, and I think it's a good thing, it's forcing everyone or more and more people to think about what kind of data is flying in the cloud and where it's flying. And, and that's increasingly harder to answer, right? Because to Chris's point, it's, not, it's no longer like you have a, your, your piece of software on your intranet. It's, no, it's all connected now. You're using service now. You're most likely connected to Workday and Salesforce and maybe integrated with your Gmail or Slack or whatever. And so how do you keep track of this? How do you know where your data is going? And, and how do you report to your CISO or, or your executive team on where it is, how it's protected? and how, how much confidence you have in the security of all of this. And, and that's um, one of the main challenges we have those days. At, at a time where we are expanding and, and the growth is so fast because there is value in multiplying and integrating with all of this, um, how in terms of security we slow that down or we also do a good job of, at tracking and auditing and reporting on all of this. Um, and then there is also a clash with money and revenue. Um, Data privacy means you should not store more data than you need on, on the cloud, but then cloud providers like to store more data because they can drive more revenue out of this. And you can see this in things like Slack was valued 40 billion for what? Because, I mean, Slack doesn't, doesn't, doesn't store anything valuable. Like they just have conversations and they can't drive anything from those conversations today, but they are valued so high just based on the assumption that one day in five years from now, 10 years from now, they'll be able to smartly drive meaningful content from those conversations. And that's kind of mind blowing to me. Um, Microsoft has claimed $10 billion in revenue from cybersecurity in 2020. And that's not a small number. And that's impacting how cloud providers think about security and their roadmaps. And 
making security for security or making security for money. And, and those conversations are also um, sometimes hard to, to handle. Um, that being said, I wanted to surface more challenges on top of this flexibility I was, I was um, showing you. Um, and I will tie, well, yeah. The, the problem is also, technically speaking, as we grow and as we host more data, some of the things that were easy to do 10 years ago, 15 years ago, are becoming increasingly complex. It was easy to re-encrypt data when you had 50 files locally on your laptop. When we're talking about cloud systems where you have, again, billions of records, because that's the size we're talking about, then how long does it take to mass encrypt or re-encrypt data when you need to re-encrypt because the key has been compromised? All those operations become increasingly complex and having good answers to those is, is definitely challenging. Um, people and inertia, um, and I think Chris and I touched on, on this already a bit, but I'm tired of so many people in the industry. <laughs> I, I'm dealing with people every day telling me, but Pierre, I know what customers want. I've been in the field for 20 years. And my answer is, well, if you, if you do today what you were doing 20 years before public cloud, you're probably doing it wrong. Like, you know, there are things have changed and, <laughs> and you should look at things differently. Um, people saying, oh, I've read, I've heard, or there are rumors. Security is one of those fields where people love to behave as if they knew more than they actually do. And that drives me nuts. Like, be honest, understand your limits. Don't try to guess more than you know. And, and let's have a honest conversation about things. Um, and that includes also shortcuts. Um, if you know, we have an institution in security called NIST, just like CDC for health, uh, that you hear a lot those days because of COVID. And, and guess what? NIST, just like CDC, as a tough job, they need to make recommendations for that is that are valid for the biggest part of the population. And just like CDC will tell you, if you leave your home, wear a mask. Because yes, it's a, it's a, it's the safest thing to do, right? It's like if you if you recommend this, and most likely it will help. It doesn't mean that this always apply in all cases. If you're lost in the woods and there is no one in a six miles radius around you, then you can drop the mask. Like it's not going to kill you or to kill anyone. Um, and it's the same with security. NIST makes recommendations. And sometimes I'm fighting with people saying, oh, these recommendations we should take as a must have. And I'm like, no, the recommendation is just a recommendation. It's the safest thing to do in most cases. Doesn't mean that you should apply that blindly in all cases. Um, so fighting that and trying to get back to the, to the reasoning and, and the state of, of well, the scientific approach to things is, is challenging also. Um, and the last slide here, um, PKI is a fancy term for public key infrastructure. What it means though is, and, and that also goes back to what Chris said on IoT and multiplication of devices and services. Just like in the real world, you, you need to have IDs and IDs is the way you're proving who you are. You're showing your, your ID when you um, enter the airport to, to onboard a plane. Um, machines work like this as well. We, we attribute certificates to all those machines and certificates can be more or less valid. Like it can be weak as your gym membership or it can be as strong as your passport or your national ID. And the business of those certificates is very complex and it's hard to scale. Um, and we see more and more companies now dealing with thousands of websites or IoT devices already raising the right flag and saying, we can't keep up. We, we, don't, we don't know how to scale granting those different IDs to all those services, to all those machines, and also being able to revoke what needs to be revoked or stop trusting what is trusted today. It, it's a hard problem to solve. On top of this, um, some of the algorithms used today are becoming increasingly weak and, and questionable. Um, and there is also the, the interface between software and hardware where um, basically something you should, you should think about. And I think if you're French, you must have had some um, good, somewhat good ed education in mathematics growing up. Um, a lot of the algorithms in security rely on take a random number. Well, just that is already questionable when it comes to software and hardware. How do you do random when you, when you move that to automation? Like how, how, do, how do you think your software does random? We can't flip a coin and, and have a zero or one. It doesn't work that way. Um, and so actually some of the hacks in the, in the history of, of cybersecurity have been exploiting that random number generation to, not, to be not so random. That's how NSA did a few tricks a few years ago. Um, there is some... You know, the quantum threat is, is here, um, and IBM 
um, is actually leading some of the efforts there. But the question is, what does the world look like after quantum, quantum computers? And, and will our algorithms survive um, quantum computing? And the answer is some of, yes, some of them yes, some of them no. And so there is currently some competitions going on to find the next generation of algorithms for quantum computing. And the French are actually doing pretty well. They are, I think, in the five or six finalists. There is one project called Bike. You can look it up if you want, B-I-K-E. That's mostly driven by French researchers. Um, pretty cool to see. And then regulations and inertia. I mean, I'm dealing with compliance those days as well, and it's a nightmare because like the federal regulations, and it's changing finally now in 2021, but until now, we were applying compliance written in 2003 before even cloud was, was a thing. And so it, it's funny to be in 2021 trying to comply to regulations that were written at a time where the, the space was completely different. Um, and, and that's sometimes not helping because it's almost con conflicting with what we should actually be doing to be secure in the cloud. Um, and then there are questions that we don't know how to answer or people don't want to answer. Um, like there is this notion of we should have the ability to change a key. And I think that concept makes sense to me because a key could be compromised. So you want to be able to change that. But then people are saying, well, if we can do it, we should also be proactive and change every six months or every year or every two years. And so my answer is great, let's do it. What, what do you want? Do you want six months? Do you want one year? Do you want two years? And I get radio silence. People don't know. The regulations are different. If you look at NIST, I think they say every year. If you look at the European regulations or recommendations, they may say two. Um, there is no good answer to this. And same, when you change the key, are you saying that we should re-encrypt data with, from the old key to use the new key? Again, when you have billions of records, that's complex. How do we deal with that? And most of the time, I get radio silence. People don't know um, what should be done. And, and, and the recommendations of the institutions are providing very vague guidelines in terms of what should be the norm. Um, and then, yes, buzzwords and holy grails. Uh, Chris mentioned zero trust. Um, I think by design, we, we cannot achieve zero trust today. One of the reasons being, going back to our certificates and IDs, you rely on, just like we rely on DMV to get us the ID, there is the equivalent in computer science. So when you, you issue the certificates, you have companies in charge of looking at your request for an ID and saying yes or no. Uh, some of them are Entrust, um, DigiCert, um, I think Verizon was doing that at some point. Um, anyway, you have those companies and by, by definition, you're trusting those to make the right call on whether or not you should have a trusted passport or a trusted national ID. Um, and that construct is everywhere in the cloud today. So there is no, zero trust is not achievable in my opinion. You can, you can aim at not adding any trust in the chain in your part of, in your slice of the cloud or in your slice of the application stack, but um, zero trust is a dream. Um, I think that's some, most of the um, provocative thoughts I wanted to bring to the table today. And with that, I will open to uh, questions and panel. Yeah, thank, thanks, Pierre. Thank, thanks, Christophe. That, that was that was that was great. Um, I took I took a lot of notes on that. And if we if we're running out of the questions, then I'll probably go through a few a few things on my side. One, one question is um, so as an individual, uh, what can I do, and what could be a better best practice to secure my my personal device? Who wants to take this one? I, I can start. Yeah, I sorry, go ahead, Chris. Okay, yeah, sorry. Um, I think the most important item, I mean, especially now that we deploy, I mean, we have more and more applications in the cloud. Uh, when it comes to zero trust, it's, it's the identity. So you have to make sure yeah, that your identity can be as trustworthy and as secure as possible. So if I, if anyone on participating uh, to this call is just using a password for his Gmail account or for his his uh, office account, I mean that that should be the last day you do this uh, because password. I mean we talked about password, but imagine imagine uh, if your Gmail account, your personal account, is compromised. What happened? So. Uh, and, and today, most most of the security events are related either to phishing, so 
uh, installing hardware, uh, malware to get access to your account or, or to your device or, or account compromise. So basically, uh, hash from a uh, list of passwords are stolen and they can be somewhat reverse engineered. And then we find your, uh, your password. Uh, so if you have only a password on, uh, I mean, you, you begging to be hacked. So what, what, what you, what should you be doing? So definitely use a two factor authentication. So that's a number one thing. If possible, something else besides a, a text message, uh, your phone, because still it's, it's 10 times or 100 times better than just a password, but it's not good enough. Uh, because uh, there have been many cases where uh, there have been uh, SIM, SIM cards have been uh, uh, hacked or, or hackers would call your, your phone company and, and claim their, uh, uh, it's their phone and have it reset. And, and basically, there, there is a way around this. So, so best, I mean, if you use a Gmail, use a Google Authenticator. Or, or I, mean, I personally use uh, like a key is called a Fido. I'm sure uh, Pia is familiar with this. Uh, it's a Yubi key, a Fido 2. Uh, uh, so basically, you store uh, uh, very secure information on this key. I mean, it's, it's a negotiation with, with uh, uh, your application provider. Uh, the, the drawback is only a few. Um, uh, a few services like Gmail, uh, Vanguard, uh, et cetera, uh, support this, uh, this standard at this point. So this would be the number one. I'm sure there would be others uh, like user password manager uh, and don't ever reuse passwords uh, because once a tr trove of password has been uh, compromised or uh, the next thing, so we try to use the same password on your bank account or your Bank of America account, same credential. So if you use the same as your Gmail, uh, your bank account is compromised. Um, yeah, so Pierre, any, any other recommendation? Um, I, I think I was, that's really where I would start as well. Strong authentication is, is where you want to start. Uh, I mean, on all of my bank accounts and, and like Gmail and, and Microsoft, I do apply those multi-factor and making sure that just the password is not what you use there. Um, I would say try and be aware also of whether it's in your personal life or even at work, what are you storing where? Meaning like my, my Gmail I know is like Alibaba's cave. Like if someone asks my Gmail, they have access to all my life because I've asked my parents multiple times their um, you know, childhood names and everything I need to claim you know, birth certificates or, or passports and stuff. So someone hacks my Gmail, it's all in there for them. So try to be sensitive of um, what, are your, what are your sensitive pieces? Is it Office 365? Is it Gmail? And do ensure that on some of those where you have sensitive information, you apply maximum security. Um, and then it, it sounds cumbersome, but another, another um, illustration I wanted to share with you is I was at RSA conference, I think two or three years ago, and someone said that there is going to be a 9-11 of cybersecurity, it's just a question of time. And, and right now security is just seen as you know, a, a hindrance. You don't want to take the time to uh, have a passcode or your Google Authenticator or your text message to validate who you are. It takes five, five to 10 more seconds to log in. Sure, but it's, it's critical. And just like you, you agree today to go to the airport one hour before um, before the plane takes off, because for security, we are all on the same page. We are saying it's, it's worth doing that to, to not take risk. It's the same with, with cloud security. I think at some point people will realize it's just part of what needs to be done and it's okay to take a bit more time to make sure we are all secure and we are doing things correctly. Yeah, I think, I think this, this, is, this, is, this is a good thing. So, Anyone have any questions? For, for, for things I, I kind of like, during listening to you guys um that uh is access everything from everywhere that that was that for me that was that was something of course that's that's the way we all live but uh this is this is something that is really getting in more and more and 
especially when you're dealing with younger people that as they don't understand that you've got all this uh, complex situation. So um, yeah, I see, I see questions. Okay, so I found AWS certificate manager, ACM meetings, more requirements than most. Do you recommend an alternate solution? That's more for Pierre, right? He's a certificate PKI expert. Um, HSNs? Um, HSNs is another one too, yeah. But um, I think most of the time, um, you will find those providers to be pretty, how to say, extensive in their offering. Like they will offer different ways to perform what you're looking for. Um, I do think AWS is pretty strong in that offering, but same as usual, make sure that you use it correctly and you don't um, like things like when you when you do PKI and certificate. One of the key things to me is, and pun intended, the key thing is to keep your private key with you as much as possible. If you're trusting with the cloud the cloud provider or the service provider to generate the key pair for you and they will hold on to your private key, then there is already questionable security right there. Um, so yes, AWS is pretty strong at security in general, but it always comes down to what are you using in their offering and how you're using that. Um, and about password managers, that's the next question. Yeah. I think there's actually a war raging right now. Uh, if you read the latest guidelines from NIST, they will tell you, uh, they will tell cloud providers, stop being stupid, stop having complexity rules and requesting special characters and, and, and number of digits. Um, stop asking for random passwords because uh, it's making things more complex and people actually go around that to, to then have even weaker setups. Um, so I, I don't have a great answer to this. Um, password managers have the drawback of centralizing all of your password in one place. So then you have to ask yourself, as I said earlier, um, how is that secured and can you trust them with that? Um, I personally use that partially for some of the passwords I have especially at work. Um, but be mindful that you're actually creating another attack surface by having this one central place uh, where your passwords are stored. Yeah, I'm, I'm personally a big fan of password manager. And, and, and this my password ma manager is protected by two factor, and, uh, and including this Fido, uh, Fido key. Um, and I do have, I mean, I, I went through some cleanup. I, I'm using, by the way, a French company's a password manager with one of the leaders in that, in that space called Dashlane. Um, and uh, I, I have like some things like 300 passwords. So that's mission impossible uh, to, to remember that many. Just like you, Pierre, there are just a few passwords for like two or three critical financial accounts that I do not store. They are just, just because they are critical to my life. Of what's for sure, what you need to eliminate, and that's the great thing about password manager, never reuse a password ever, ever. Just because if, 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 if it's hack once, uh, it's a gate to, to access um, many, other of your many other applications. Yeah, that's okay. later. But, but you, you have others like last, last password, one password. Uh, la um, yeah, and, and they moved, by the way, they moved to a subscription model, just like Office 365 and so on. So. So now it's becoming more and more more expensive, but, but uh, that I, I don't pay for many uh, pieces of software pieces of software, but that's one of them, uh, and I think that's a good wise investment, at least for me. So one of the questions we also have is is what about the privacy policies? You know, uh, what, what's what's your take on privacy policies when you've got to to when you you install a software or you go to a website and, and they have this this huge privacy policy that, that you've got to get to, to 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 give access to almost all of your life uh especially on on your device so um what, what's your take on that i i think the battle is already lost when it comes to to privacy uh when it comes and i know it's always a war of religion between Apple and Android. I mean, Apple has a better track record when it comes to uh, to privacy, uh, significantly better than than, uh, than Google, for instance, or 
the worst of the lot is Facebook, but uh, uh, but also it's uh, every, it's all about how you you set up things. So if if you use Google on your phone and you have location enabled, so you'll be tracked. Uh, you you know how on one six um, the people at the Capitol got tracked. I mean mostly through their, their cellular phones and. Uh, so there is no anonymity, and that's back to to my my third or fourth chart. Where I mean, security people, what they want is uh, no access to, uh, to anything and live like a hermit. So if if you're concerned about the privacy, don't use internet, don't use your phone, and, and uh, there is only so so many uh, mitigating factors. Awesome. Hey. Pierre, you want to you want to conclude on that because we've got to almost wrap up. <laughs> yeah, I was going to say, um, I mean, privacy is not something new, right? In, in some extent, if you if you sign um, a loan for your house, um, I don't know about you, but I die every single time I do that because you're signing those you know hundred pages where you're basically giving up everything to those lenders who make money out of just selling your information, right? I think the danger with cloud is that this is done implicitly like you until recently and we are getting better at this but you had no idea how those companies were making money on top of your information and that includes sadly facebook namely um i think jdpi is helping there and and that's where and same there is a friction with usability and privacy there where now every time you go to a website you have this first page saying do you agree to all cookies do you want to customize things and and my advice to you would be the same it all depends on What's the website you're going to, and what are they requesting access to? Uh, if it's a stupid thing, it's just one or two things that could do and accept all. Sometimes I am conscious enough to say, "Well, looks like it's a lot. Let me go in and actually deactivate some of this because they have no business storing this for me." And sometimes when they don't even allow me, and it's too crazy, and the list is like 50 things they are trying to capture on me, I'm like, "Bye. Uh, this article looks looks interesting, but you have no business stealing this from me. I'm gonna look somewhere else." Okay, so uh, the question it was uh, the, the the question regarding the key from Man Manuel. This is um, this is yeah the UB key, uh, and I pasted that in the chat. Guys, uh, thank you very much. I think we could continue because I had more questions, but uh, it's the top of the hour, and we really need to go. Pierre, enjoy your morning. Uh, Chris, enjoy your afternoon. Uh, all of the rest, I don't know where you are, but enjoy your evening for the one in Alsace. And uh, you know, I've got, I've got my, I've got my pretzel. Okay, so bye bye, and see you next month. Thank you again. Bye. Bye. Thank you guys. Bye. Thank you. Bye.